again to the end of Jesus' life as we get ready to celebrate the beginning of Jesus' life on earth. We're reading from his final discourse. This is what came before last week's um, scripture in John. But this is the first time I think ever during the Sundays of Advent that I have just, instead of just preaching the lectionary, I'm preaching on the themes of Advent, which is, what was the first Sunday? It was what? Hope. Second was? Peace. Third is? Joy. If you don't know joy by now, the kids spelled it for you every way possible. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. A little while and you will no longer see me, and again a little while you will see me. And some of his disciples said to one another, what does he mean by saying to us a little while and you will no longer see me and again a little while and you will see me? And because I'm going to the Father. They said, what does he mean by this a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, are you discussing among yourselves what I meant when I said a little while and you will no longer see me and again a little while and you will see me? Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn, but the world will rejoice you will have pain, but your pain will turn into joy. When a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when her child is born, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy of having brought a human being into the world. So you have pain now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. On that day, you will ask nothing of me. Very truly, I tell you, if you ask anything of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be complete. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When I started in ministry, I was in deaf ministry. I did everything I did now. I do now, but in sign language. And I served the Magathy Church of the Deaf in Anne Arundel County. And we called the church where we met, which was called Magathy United Methodist Church, we referred to them as the Magathy Church of the Hearing. And once a year we did a retreat together at Drayton Manor, which was this beautiful old place over on the eastern shore that no longer belongs to the United Methodist Church. But we'd go over there and we'd have a retreat. It was wonderful. And I interpreted the whole time. Now, there was a lady named Pauline who was from Magathy Church of the Hearing, and she was a little bit of a wacky girl. And she was talking about joy one day, and she said, you know, what we need to do is we need to be thankful no matter what happens to us. And I'm all over that. Amen, amen, amen. She said, so if you're driving in Baltimore City at night and you're in a really dangerous neighborhood and God sends you a flat tire, you have to say, thank you, Lord, for giving me this flat tire. I had to interpret it because, you know, you can't clean up what somebody says, but I disagreed with that. While I think there is nothing that I've ever seen that God cannot redeem, I do not think God sends people flat tires on dark, lonely, scary roads. Well, I didn't have to say anything because there was this lady there named Estelle who was part of the Church of the Hearing. And I will never forget this because the word she spoke had to come out of my hand. She looks and said, Pauline, you're full of, and she said the word. The sugar honey iced tea word. She said it, and I had to sign it. And people, the deaf people went, what? <laughs> now, you've got to understand, Estelle was in her 90s. So it really just blew everybody right out of the water with that one. And we all sort of stopped and looked at her and said, tell us more. And she said, you know, my mother died when I was a kid. I was raised by people who didn't love me. Then I grew up and I married the love of my life and in just a few years after we were married when we had two children, he was killed in an accident. She said, I have not known much happiness. She said, but I have known joy. And she looked at me and she said, honey, don't let nobody steal your joy. Something that Miss Betty, that I've mentioned to you before from Harmony said to me many times, honey, don't let nobody steal your joy. Y'all heard that one? It's a good one to remember. Because joy is something that is with us always, unless we let somebody take it from us. And we can't, we can't, nobody can steal your joy. You can only hand it over with both hands if you forget what joy is about. Let's look at the passages this morning. Isaiah, a wonderful passage from a wonderful prophecy. Isaiah, one of the great prophets of Israel. And what do prophets do? They warn you about you're going to get what you got coming if you're not smart enough to change your ways. So Isaiah is preaching to this group of stubborn, stiff-necked people saying, you know, you got to remember where your salvation comes from. you got to remember that God has given you everything you have. You have to give God the credit. God's the one who led you to freedom through the sea. God's the one who brought you into your own land. But if you continue with this faithless, crazy behavior, God's going to let it be taken from your hand. 
And so that's what happens. And then immediately when they are in exile, Isaiah starts to prophesy about the end of exile and God's restoration. And that's what this is from. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. For though you were angry with me, your anger turned away and you comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord is my strength and my might and has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And on that day you will say, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the nations, proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be known in all the earth. Shout aloud and sing for joy, a royal Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Sounds nice, doesn't it? It's a great hymn of praise, and we think of hymns of praise happening when more things are going our way, but this is written for people in exile away from their home, away from their temple, away from their way of life, everything that's ever been familiar to them. And in that place, the promise is restored to them and God will redeem them and God will comfort them and they will draw water from the wells of salvation. We don't have any sense. Anybody here grew up with a well that you had to pump when you were a kid? We got a West Virginian over here. John pumped some water when he was a kid. We go to the tap and we turn it on and water comes out, don't we? Can you imagine what it was like to carry a bucket and have to lower it and have to pull it up full of water again and again and again to have anything to drink? And it was real scary when you pulled it up. It didn't look like what comes out of the tap, did it? But what they're going to be drawing is water from the well of salvation. Their thirst, their internal longings are all going to be satisfied through this God. Then Colossians. Now, throughout the New Testament writings, the, the, the letters were written to people who are often suffering from persecution for their faith. And what does the writer say to them? But endure everything with patience. How many of you are patient? Raise your hand if you're patient. We've got some patient folks here. Raise your hand if you are not a patient person at all. Oh, my goodness. Look at y'all. Yes, we had someone at the first service say, I pray regularly, God give me patience. Give it to me right now. <laughs> we know what that's like, don't we? But not only are we called to endure with patience, and what do you endure? Do you endure good times? I had to endure that ice cream sundae. No. I had to endure that chocolate. No. I had to endure when I had shingles. Yeah, we get that one, don't we? But endure with patience? Not only endure with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father, Joy is something that cannot be taken from us. We can only hand it over. So honey, don't let nobody steal your joy. And then the passage from the gospel, Jesus again saying things that confuse the disciples then and the disciples now. This is a hard passage because what does it end with? Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be complete. Anything you ask of God in Jesus' name, he will give to you a passage that keeps so many people from faith, from Christianity, from saying we're a pie in the sky, Pollyanna sort of religion, because what we have is this God who promises us, whatever you ask my name, I'll give you. Who here can say that all your prayers have ever been answered the way you wanted them to be answered? When you pray for someone you love who's very sick to get better, when you pray for your child to come home who is in the world and you don't know where they are. Or when things just have economically turned bad for you. You're afraid you can't make your house payment next month. Or you're facing addiction or something like that. And you say, God, get me out of this. And God does not act in the way you want. I say that's when we treat God like Santa Claus and say, this is what I need you to do, Lord. I figured it all out. In your name I pray, amen. And it doesn't work that way. But if we are constantly in prayer for one another, that God's will may be done in our midst, that's when God will answer and speak mightily to us. It's not an easy thing to be joyful, is it? Sometimes, because life does not seem to make us all that happy. But joy and happiness are not the same thing at all. Happiness depends on what's going on in your life right now. And Christmas is a good time to be happy it's a time to remember all that we have and all that we share and all that we have been promised, but it also can be a time of great joy. 
if you sit with those shepherds and with Mary, if you remember the truth of the story, which is that it was not all that happy, was it? Poor people, a young girl married to a stranger, giving birth in a stable, the Lord of all things, the creator of all things, being laid in a manger filled with hay. Shepherds, the poorest of the poor, being told the great good news of joy for all people. And they went back that night rejoicing. They didn't go back to a raise and pay. They didn't go back to a fancy house with warmth and heat and light. They were just as cold, just as poor, just as destitute, just as looked down upon, but nothing in their life would ever be the same again because the joy of God had been revealed to them, the poorest of the poor. So that's when I remember that Christ has come to me at the worst times of my life. Now, when I was in college, I took physics of light and color, which was also known as science for English majors. This was one of those where you didn't have to do any math or anything like that. Anybody else here an English major who took the basic thing? But I took physics of light and color because it was about photography. It was about light. It helped me out a lot. Um, and one of the things I learned in there that I've seen happen again and again, rainbows always show better wear. Think about it, against a dark sky. When it's very light, you can barely see the rainbow, but you put it against a dark sky, it stands out in sharp contrast. I have seen the light of Christ most clearly in my light at the worst possible moments. That's when the joy is there. Happiness, ah, eh, it's fleeting. But joy is eternal and unshakable in Jesus Christ. So my prayer for you this day is that you may know joy. Happiness, you'll know it from time to time, and you'll lose it from time to time. But if you know joy, it will never fail you. I promise you that. And the world is in need of joy, not happiness. Now I'm going to get in trouble for this, but life is not a Hallmark movie, boys and girls. Don't you wish it were? Wouldn't the life be, now how many of you are there going to throw a hymnal at me because I'm dissing your Hallmark movies again? you got to love a Hallmark movie. There is no racism in Hallmark movies, is there? There is no. And have you ever seen a house decorated like a Hallmark movie? If I took my year's salary, I couldn't put up all those decorations. If I took my year's work, I couldn't put up all. How many of you string lights on your homes? Some of you do that. How many of you have lights and 19 trees in every room, all decorated and beautiful. How many of you bake cookies and pipe the frosting so it's absolutely perfect? I sure don't. Don't mistake that for joy. Because in a Hallmark movie, there's very little mention of Jesus other than, I, I heard one this morning, because I, I will admit, I leave Hallmark on all night at my house because... I go to sleep with the TV on, and the commercials on Hallmark are like Preparation H and laxative stuff like that. There's no screaming, there's no warfare, there's no violence in these commercials. I can sleep right on through a Hallmark movie. But I wake up sometimes to the unmistakable strains of Charles Wesley's great hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, but it's being played by a jazz band with people dancing to it, and I'm thinking, that's a little weird. But that is not joy. Joy is when all the lights on your tree don't work, the kids are screaming, you can't afford the turkey. Joy is knowing that no matter what happens, Christ has come. If you read my last pastor's page in the newsletter, which I, don't, I won't fault you if you didn't read it, but I had a quote from Thomas Merton, into this demented inn where he is neither wanted nor welcome, Christ comes. We do live in a demented inn, don't we? The world is crazy crazier by the day sometime, but it's precisely where Christ comes again and again and again. Christ comes to me when I'm broken. Christ comes to me when I'm sinful and stubborn. Christ comes to me when I don't want to cut up and preach in the morning. Christ comes to me when my knee hurts so badly I think I'm not going to be able to get out of the chair. That's when Christ comes to me, and that is my joy, and honey, nobody's ever going to steal my joy. I'm not going to give it away because it is not from me. It is from my Savior. And I'm called to share that joy with you and with others. 
You have it in you, folks. You have that joy of Christ in you. Surely it is God who saves me. I will trust in him and not be afraid, for the Lord is my stronghold and my sure defense, and he will be my savior today, tomorrow, for the rest of my life, for the rest of eternity. Share that joy with someone who needs it. Share it from the depth of your soul. And the world will be a different place because of you letting Christ out of your heart into the world. Amen, amen, amen.